Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. The way American workers work is changing. 30% of them work independently. That means they're working without the traditional support of employer benefits, you know, like health insurance. Sarah Horowitz founded a new kind of union, the Freelancers Union, to represent their needs, and she's the executive director and very happily my guest today. Hello. Hi. <laughs> you are really on the, I, I hate to use that expression, but the cutting end, edge of unionism, right? Yeah. yeah, definitely. And are you respected by the other big unions? You know, I think that in the beginning, a lot of people, they weren't opposed to us, but they didn't really take us that seriously, like maybe we were a little fringe. But I think that increasingly, as we have the numbers and are able to do the things that we do, we're getting a lot more respect. And I am a great supporter and I've always been in the labor movement my whole life, so um, mm -hmm. consider myself to be <laughs> in that. So do you t let's talk about the, your union, mm -hmm. the difference basically, the difference is the, 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 the whole, the, the complexion of the whole group, right? Well, you know, let me just say I think that there are two elements of any union regardless of whether it's craft or industrial or our kind and the two elements are you have to bring people together to solve problems and you have to have revenue through dues or some other thing and so we have those two elements what is different is that in the 1930s when we drafted the labor laws we said unions will do collective bargaining and because freelancers go from job to job and project to project they can't do collective bargaining so we very much figure out ways to bring people together to have power to purchase together in markets and then political power and policy and advocacy. So do you think, do you equate then the freelancers with, for instance, the hotel and uh, workers union where they're, hotel, they're waiters and they're this and they're that? Because they are different, but it's one industry. Yeah, well those are different kinds of uh, ways that people have organized. They're I think the group, trade unions. Yeah, I mean, I would say the group that we probably are the most like would be the entertainment unions, where mm -hmm. people, go from job to job and project to project. The difference is that in the 1930s, they were there at the table as entities. And, and they so the they, all the people that work in those industries are W-2 employees, and therefore they got grandfathered into the labor laws. So is your goal to amend the labor laws? Well, not in that regard, because I think that we have to evolve. And this is just where the workforce is going. It's flexible, and people are going from job to job. And that's what companies and employers want. But what we now have to figure out is how do we make that fair and how do we build security for this new workforce? And those are the kinds of labor laws we want to change. So for instance, if you are an independent contractor, self-employed freelancer, you're not getting unemployment insurance. Right. You're not covered under race, age, or gender discrimination laws. Not that anybody just, intended you're, you're it. They just forgot own. about you. Yeah. So we're here to change that. It's, it's so interesting because as we, as corporations downsize, or what they like to call it, I mean, the thing they're interested in is lowering their overhead, right? Which becomes the pension and health and all the benefits. So they have contract workers. Are contract workers covered? Well, co covered in terms of... By the corporation? Well, I mean, I think increasingly what we're seeing is that companies aren't providing the benefits that they once did. And what I think is really happening is that the workforce is moving in this direction right. and not the other way around. And what we have found is that there are definitely people who are getting laid off and the first thing they would really like is to get a full-time job with benefits. But the truth is that those right. jobs are just getting fewer and fewer and we really need to be recognizing that this is where we're going so we must build up the institutions we need. So you have a long-range plan. The first one was health insurance, mm -hmm. right? Tell us about the health insurance. So right now in New York, we have a model. We have 120,000 members nationally, 75,000 in New York. Surprisingly, New York, of course, is our number one state. California is our number two. In New York, we have over 21,000 people who get our health insurance, and that was just recognized, actually, by the legislature in Albany, in New York, uh, that is recognizing for the first time our freelancers model, which brings freelancers together and treats us as if we work for one big company, which, of course, makes sense, because think of how many companies are in New York that have 21,000 employees. Right, not not many. too many, right. but we were treated like a small group before, so now we're saying, uh-uh, freelancers have to be treated like a large group because that's what we are. 
So what kind of insurance do you have? What kind of health insurance? How did you go about providing the health insurance? Well, you know, the, f the funny thing is when I started the Freelancers Union, I had no interest or knowledge of insurance. And <laughs> just when talking to people, that was, pe that was the number one issue. So it's been a bit of a learning journey, you know, 10 years ago, just trying to figure out how to group people together. Over the years, then we started getting our own policy. So we would have an insurance company that would just give us a policy. And we worked with HIP, which is now Emblem. Um, and then we realized in doing that that you really don't have the power to have your own actuaries and your own lawyers working on your own group to ensure that freelancers would get their own plans and plans that were tailored to them. So last January, we started an insurance company. Uh, we raised $17 million from nonprofit sources so that the nonprofit became the owner. So we have no private shareholders. And in effect, we're like a co-op. We're like a, a new kind of mutual insurance well, company. Let's take your plan and put it into the plans that are being considered in Washington. How, does, how do they compare and how do they fit? You know, it's a really good question. And in a nutshell, we're still having a discussion about, you know, large employers and individuals. And what we really haven't realized is that the labor movement and other groups can be a part of grouping people together to deliver health insurance. And so um, our membership really probably doesn't quite fit in to the discussions yet. And so um, I'd say low income freelancers in particular or people who go in and out of being low income because mm -hmm. the income's so episodic will hopefully have some floor that will be a little bit higher than Medicaid. And I think that's really important. And uh, But in other ways, you know, I view this as the first step. You know, we need to get legislation passed. It's the first step, and then we have to but think about the But does your vision next. look like the co-op plan that some people are talking about in the state? Um, yes and no. I think the, the kind of the zeitgeist of it, yes. And so by that I mean there is no way in America where you are going to have the free market deliver health insurance in to everybody, just simply abracadabra, because Affordably it's not also. sustainable. Yeah. It's you know, the, the, if you have private equity investors and they want you to return that money in the short term and make a lot of money on top of that, you just can't stay with people as they grow old and get sick. Whereas we, because we have a sustainable economic model, our goal is to take care of our members when they're young, when they're old, when they're healthy, when they're sick, and to do it in a sustainable way. Will you be, but this is all done though on, with foundation support. That's just for the capital reserves, capital. just because when you start I an insurance see. company, you need capital. So do you think you're gonna be able to do it in the future without additional support? Right, we, we already are you doing are. it so that we, before the insurance company, when we had the freelancers union, the freelancers union didn't need foundation support back from 2006. And so when we raise money, it's always for our R&D or new kinds of projects or piloting new models. For instance, we have a retirement account now, a retirement system where it's a group system. You don't have to be the one to manage everything and figure it out. It's a group 401k, and it's a target date fund if you don't want to deal with it. Or if you're somebody who loves to deal with it, you can deal with it as much as you want. So these are the kinds of things that we're working on. The next, the next thing we want to work on is an unemployment protection fund because people's incomes go up and down and they can't get unemployment. And insurance is probably not a vehicle because people will have times during the year that they, they won't. won't. Yeah. So actually, we just endorsed Mayor Bloomberg, and Mayor Bloomberg has made it clear that he is going to put his um, weight of, of his office behind uh, going to D.C. to start talking about a new kind of unemployment protection for freelancers. And that becomes a Washington issue. That's not a state issue. The state can't change it. Well, I think the state can could do, could something. do something and also potentially create some kind of pilot. Mm. But over time, it's definitely not a city issue because the city can't yeah, ever can't pay that it. kind of money. Do you, do you ever foresee, could it be possible that another insurance company will come and say, we can supply your members with a lower rate? lower cost? You know, it's funny because when we started the insurance company, as you can imagine, um, you know, it's funny that we're in the industry and I like a lot of the people in it actually, yeah. but um, <laughs> they're not always, you know, they don't the have most the public goal. spirited, right. let's just say. <laughs> and so as soon as we started with our insurance company, they'd kind of swoop in and we'd, they'd go on our message boards, the brokers, and um, you know they came in, they lowered their prices in the next quarter, they raised them right again. And so I think what people are realizing is you really, it's really a trusted entity, and that's and what a mutual that is. Yeah. Yes. 
it's, it's but our, our rates are less expensive for sure and also we partner with Empire which is like the best network in right. New York um, but How regardless many of that does New York have well there's Empire and then there you know there used to be a lot more yeah. like GHI and hip were the two nonprofits right. they now are going uh, for profit and they've merged um, and then there's HealthNet and um, Atlantis so there are a bunch a of different ones uh, which is probably a bit more than in a lot of other parts of the country. Uh, but I think it's pretty clear that before we came along, there was no such thing as a freelancer plan. And now you see a lot more activity. See, what, what it reminds me of is, or what, it, in, what I think about it is, is it, is it the equivalent of what would be the public option? You know, in some ways, if it you is. think about the public option yeah. and you say to yourself, well, what are the goals of a public option? You know, number one is you want competition with for-profits, and we're already doing that. The second piece is foundation money is all subsidized through the tax code, meaning it's public. So in many ways that we were set up with these kinds of capital, uh, it's already percent, like yeah. a public plan. Right. And I think it's where the, where the direction is, is going. And if you look in a lot of different parts of the insurance industry, 30% of it is already mutual. Like mm. nationwide is a mutual, guardian is a mutual. So what does that mean? It means that the um, policyholders are owners. Uh, and what you have is an economic alignment between the people who are getting the insurance and the owners, as opposed to what happened in health, where there are like virtually none, I think we're probably it or a few others, the people who own it and the people who use it are now two completely different people. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so the life insurance and other insurance things have really changed while the health insurance has always remained the profit-making Well, it, no, actually, we, to... through the Reagan era, they all demutualized. Oh, and all, and oh. that's why health insurance, you know, oh. one of the things that often that really should be part of this debate, I think, is that the health insurance industry merged like crazy and they got their money from private equity. In order to satisfy that, that's when you started seeing the major cherry picking across the country. And we really have to go back and say where you get your money, like in anything in life, is right. relevant. You know, if you get your money from like yeah. your in-laws or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. all, money always has strings attached from your mother, from you know wherever. So that's if so you get money from that's private equity, they com want something. Right. That's so. very an, an interesting concept. It's something good to carry around. It's very good. Uh, you've become. I mean, you're really like an, you're an expert now in insurance. Are you the president of the insurance? Yes. <laughs> I'm the lowest paid CEO in America. <laughs> it's very powerful. Do you feel powerful? Um, yes, I do. Good. <laughs> Reagan really destroyed or tried to destroy the union movement. Did we pay enough attention to that? I, I mean, I remember PACO was yeah. shocking. But now when you've talked about other things, it, it was a, a terrible era for workers. Right? Well, it was a sea change. And yeah. you know what I think that has happened is that we started looking at particular kinds of problems and blaming the union movement, yeah. not realizing in America we do a good job or have done a really good job of building a middle class. You know, middle mm -hmm. classes have to be built. They don't mm -hmm. just form. And unions are one of the most important ways that we form a middle class. And why should we care? Well, if you don't have a middle class, who's paying taxes and who's staying in a local yes, area? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I think we've really lost. And so I worry that our economy is going to start looking like more like, let's say, Argentina with a small group of very wealthy people and a lot of everybody okay, else. Yeah. And if we don't put in these kinds of policies, that's what we're going to have. So your freelancers union is really the example of the need to come together for power. Yes. Which is what the unions did when they collective bargained. Right? Yes. And in fact, a lot of what we do, um, you know, there are models for this. So my hero is Sidney Hillman, who is the head of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union, who built, you know, talk about labor entrepreneurship. You know, he built housing yes. and Amalgamated Bank and insurance companies, and those things exist today. And, uh, and then not only that, he pioneered the first unemployment system and then brought that to Washington. So we, we built that in New York. So are you planning in the long future, is that part of the things on your list yes. to build housing? Oh, you. Um, you know, housing, workspace. Yeah. Um, and, and the whole concept of co-ops, it's, it's such a sensible concept. It's, I think it's the future. Well, yeah. But I think what's and unfortunate- it's, so, it's an old concept. It is an old concept. In fact, you know, interestingly, little Factoid. It was started in the 1870s in upstate New York. And if people w go to Wikipedia and type in Rochdale principles, yeah. R O C H E 
D A L E, yeah. and the operating system for cooperatives started here. And then there was a split by the turn of the of the last century, and people started focusing more on what government could do, as that was the traditional left. And we lost this tradition that we have to get back to. And that's one thing in health reform that I've been concerned about is people feel very strongly that the co-ops were suggested as a bait and switch to the yeah. public plan, which may very well have been true. Right. But the they downside is that it. people should be loving cooperatives because they're brilliant. And, and you own part of it, yeah. When I was in high school, which was many years ago, uh, at Music and Art, which is up near City College, we had a co-op store. And um, I loved it, I, I, with the two pine trees and the sign. And we sold art and music supplies and school supplies. And we all owned shares, and we sold it at cost. Um, and Max Frankel from the Times was the president the year before me, and then I became the president. And it was such a sensible con that I carried it so long through life. I mean, yeah. we, uh, my husband and I and a group of friends did a housing co-op in the did 60s. Did you do babysitting co-ops in the 70s? No, we never did that. My mother was in a babysitting oh, yeah. co-op. Yes. Yeah, and my grandma it. lived in the union co-op. Right. But yeah, no, it's so it's true. And thing. people might also be surprised that Lando Lakes is a marketing co-op. Uh, Ace oh, Hardware is, right? is a marketing co-op. The co-ops are very much a part of our fabric. We just kind of don't don't, don't see recognize it, recognize it, or, or understand it. Yes, and it goes back then to the money. So maybe with all the stuff on Wall Street and everything else, we'll come and we'll vision that you need your own ownership and your own leverage to yes. do something. So um, you've got. Let's talk about some other things that affect it. You've got all kinds of freelancers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you even have organizations that mm -hmm. are affiliated, partners. right? Mm -hmm. Partners. I mean, what kind of organizations? Let's show the range. Sure, of the Graphic Artists Guild is uh, yeah. a big one, and um, not pro so non -profit. yeah, not yeah. profit um. or professional associations. And then the f our freelance membership really ranges from people in the financial sector who have gotten laid off or been longtime consultants, graphic artists, um, web designers, nannies, um, people who work in the nonprofit sector. Healthcare professionals. In fact, we often have doctors who write in about you know all the things that we're doing wrong in uh, our insurance <laughs> company. People who do acupuncture. Yeah, that's okay. Do you work? Is there still a union, a, a group trying to unionize household workers? Yeah, there's the domestic workers well, united. And do you work and with them? Are yeah, they affiliated with you? Um, yeah, I mean loosely, but yeah. they just had a bill that passed the assembly that was really terrific, and the Taxi Cab Workers yeah. Alliance, the, Rock. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of really good activity, as well as the entertainment unions. And so, what's interesting is that there's a very broad c group that is starting to emerge that really fabulous. represents people across the board. Yeah, it's really fabulous. So you were recently had a victory in Albany with a tax issue. Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is another thing you're advocating and you're lobbying for changes. Yes, and um, and hoping to win on top <laughs> of that. Um, so and I think that's important. You know, we're not here to like make a principle. Those are that's important too. But like there you're are really things we in have there to do. And yes, there's a lot to do. And so what happened is in the 1970s when New York City was really cash strapped. Uh, there was this tax, the unincorporated business tax, that was, you know, probably correct. But nobody thought that of uh, freelancers back then. And then over the decades, freelancers were the, you know, the dolphins in the tuna net. They really weren't anticipated to be paying into that. And because they had no political clout, people didn't care. And not only that, they, um, we were losing money when we lost the commuter tax. Let's not pass too fast. The unincorporated business tax, explain that. So it's on uh, different kinds of partnerships and others where the goal was to avoid paying corporate taxes. So this new tax was created in the 70s to address the people who were typically in the corporate tax And it, it also affected shopkeepers, didn't it? Stores? Well, it depends on and how they were structured. Relation, yeah. If and it was an independent person in a yes, store. Yeah, so it became this tax that just sort of started taking on a life of its own and freelancers were never contemplated in it and so we have been working for some time. David Yasky and the City Council started uh, hearings. Uh, Bill Thompson also was an early uh, supporter of getting rid of that tax and then just last year the mayor took that on. We all went to Albany and uh, freelancers were exempt who earn up to $100,000. They just completely don't have to pay. And then between 100 and 150, it's a, a tax credit.
It's really, it, it's one of these little things that you find out when you're there alone getting a bill. Yes. And we just got a bill the other day for the new tax. Yes. And you explained that. Sure. Um, <laughs> one thing that's also really important, I think, about that UBT is that it, and then we'll get into this new tax, is that it was 4% of income. And in some ways, it's a mini stimulus package because people mm -hmm. now are getting one, two, three thousand dollars $3,000 back, and it's money they it's need good. right now. Yeah. Um, so then, of course, you know, after that big battle of 4%, uh, people started getting notices that they had to pay this MTA catchment area tax, and it's much smaller. But you know, it's just it's a, a very feeling small of tax. it's what is a point. Yeah, it's point three. three. Yeah. yeah, so you know, but it's it a rankles pain. because we don't have that commuter tax. Yes, and um, <laughs> yeah, so you know, what are you going to do? Like, it's it's bad in terms of people, but you know, this time. You know, leave it, I think, to the tax collectors to be the ones who understand the change in the workforce ahead of all the other elected yeah. officials because, like, <laughs> they got right on it. And um, But at least they got freelancers fair yeah. and square. You don't have to like it, but right. we, we were. Fair. Now, this, was, this is a gigantic enterprise. I mean, you're really affecting national policy. How did all this start? You're a, a nice young woman from Brooklyn, right? Uh-huh. And you went to where? Stuyvesant? Yes. Stuyvesant. And friends. And friends, and then on to Cornell, to mm -hmm. the School of Labor, and, and then to law school. And you worked as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So where did you get this idea, and then how did you take this idea and translate it into a living company, living group? Well, you know, the funny thing is, growing up in a certain era in New York, you know, my grandfather was a vice president of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, and my father was a union side labor lawyer. So. I thought you could only be a union organizer or a worker, um, you know, up until like the age of 20. Uh, so I knew I was always going to work in the labor movement. And as I was working, um, it became clear to me that there was this new thing that was happening. And not surprisingly, also, I worked in a labor law firm that made me an independent contractor um, oh. instead of paying me benefits. And so I was kind of ahead of the game in terms of How having that happen. How could a labor lawyer do that? Well, if only, right? So um, what can you say? But it got me really thinking um, and seeing what was happening in, in the work that I was doing that we needed to think about new models. And so I started, and you know, I had been a union organizer myself. And whenever you're organizing, the thing you have to figure out is you know, what do people need the most? And the number one thing was health insurance. So when you started, when you started, you got this concept and you started, what did you do? Did you talk to friends and associates? You had to write up something. Did you have some friends helping you write the initial plan, the business plan, or whatever oh, yeah. it was? For sure. I mean, yeah. I, I, um, I actually went off to the Kennedy School for a year, oh. which I think of as an intellectual sabbatical, and spent the time talking to academics across the, the, the different schools in the area. I worked with Charles Heckscher from Rutgers, who's mm -hmm. still on our board after all these many years, and uh, started putting together a board of uh, different people. And so there have been many people along the way who worked on this and helped fundraise for it. And, um, and then also, in no small part, I think, was this idea of social entrepreneurship that sort of came out of nowhere for me. I mean, in my house, entrepreneur wasn't necessarily a good word. And, but it said, you know, if you have an idea, go forth and do it. Put something together. Um, and don't be afraid. Whatever ideology is out there, just figure out how to do it. And so for, for me, it was understanding of this idea of new labor with the idea of a revenue model and realizing that we had to build up the services that people needed to pay for the whole thing over time so there'd be an economic engine that could sustain it. And that has always been, I think, the special sauce is we provide services that members need. In providing that service, we find out how only, they only go so far. You have to advocate. So our advocacy agenda can be built off from our understanding. And then the advocacy agenda is always affected by the services that people need. So it's those two really are iterative. It's, it's very much like being a public official, actually. I mean, you get, you get the complaints from your constituents, and you see the pattern that's falling, and you know what it is, mm -hmm. and then you get an idea and you frame it. Uh, a good public official. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then you respond to it outside. Uh, do you, it, you do some work in Washington also. Mm -hmm. What other committees are you uh, involved in other than the, I mean, what other issues other than 
for instance, insurance? Yeah, I mean, we've mostly been Human. working in, in, in looking at the insurance. Um, ultimately, though, I think it's going to be very important, obviously, labor and looking at what mm -hmm. our federal labor laws are. But I'd be curious if I can ask you, I mean, what do you notice as a difference between sort of the elected officials as a group now versus when you it was, started? It, it, it hasn't improved. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't think it was very distinguished when I was in the city council, and actually it was very uh, disappointing, and I came out of it quite cynical. Um, although I regained with the Obama campaign, I mm -hmm. rose, all that enthusiasm that I used to have all the time rose with that. Uh, and I, I'm still a big Obama fan. I can't stand it with all the nitpicking mm -hmm. and all this, you know, I guess it's the cable television and the need to talk about something all day long. I don't yeah. know. Um, but I am dismayed by the quality of public officials, and especially... Uh, well, I don't know, th even, yeah, all of them. I think the people have a an obligation to vote, and they don't. So it's the people's fault in the long run that they aren't paying attention to who they elect, mm -hmm. and they're electing mediocrity. If I had a, a, bus a company, a group like you, I wouldn't hire most of the public officials I've met. Hmm. I just wouldn't. Uh, does that... Uh, you know, don't say it because you're going to be dependent on them, but it's a very difficult position. Well, you know, one of the things is I think part of it is that we haven't been building up the organizations that people have learned how to be great mm -hmm. citizens in. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the things that is our obligation at the Freelancers Union. So we've formed a pact. We're now registering our members. We're providing ways for people to learn how to be leaders. And I think that's crucial. And I'm actually convinced that the elected officials will come around whether they um, – love the idea or right, don't right. because yeah. we're the constituents right. and absolutely and over time that's really that going to be the point you've got that whole idea of, of organizing for the leverage to affect things you have a website and you have an address and we will put it on the screen and people can do it it's wonderful i think you're just incredible and i wish you all the luck in the world well, thanks for having me thank you If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.